Okay, hello, and welcome to the fifth annual F Frameless XR Symposium. I'm Susan Lakin, and I'm a professor in the School of Photographic Arts and Sciences at the Rochester Institute of Technology. I'm this year's um, symposium chair and uh, co-chair of Frameless Labs with my colleague and longtime collaborator in computer science, Joe Geigel. I'd like to acknowledge Joe, who is always ready for an adventure, including hosting a virtual symposium symposium during a very challenging year. Um, I'd like to express my continued thanks for all his efforts in support of Frameless. We have a great lineup of presentations and I'd like to thank and express my gratitude to the symposium organizing committee for their contributions to the program. I'd like to take just a minute to pull up my screen here to acknowledge everyone on the committee because it's been truly a shared effort and uh, just some amazing people. Um, it's been really a team effort with collaboration across disciplines and it includes colleagues at the University of Rochester as, re as well as RIT. As you all know, it's been an extremely difficult year for everyone, yet all the individuals on this list have made time in their overloaded work schedule to help deliver this year's symposium. I continue to be so impressed by their dedication to everything frameless and thank them all for their contributions. I'd particularly like to highlight our student workers this year who have done just an amazing job assisting with the event and couldn't have done it without them. Uh, Tessa Coda is a fourth year new media student in the College of Art and Design. She's been literally my right hand all term. She has helped with every aspect of the organization from our Facebook Live conversations with alumni, the launching of the new Frameless RIT branded website, to design work and so much more. She rises to any challenge I give her and continues to be a valuable asset to the team. Connor Clerkey is a second year computational mathematics student in Gosnell College of Science. He joined the team when we decided to move our student design virtual worlds onto the Hubs Cloud on Amazon Web Services. He managed the setup process and continued this and, and created, excuse me, the symposium discord server to assist in centralizing communication channels during the event. Behind the scenes as I speak, monitoring the success of all technical aspects of the event is Samar Khanna. He's a second year software engineering graduate student in uh, Golisano College of Computing and Information Sciences. He has been on board providing technical support since the beginning, helping with our student competition, working with Connor on the cloud setup, testing and solving computational challenges. He's been amazing and really has been a great help uh, with the symposium. We're working on several new and uh, evolving platforms. Therefore, we have set up a tech support channel on Discord. So if you run into any technical problems, please use this channel and we'll try to address any issues as soon as possible. The structure of our um, presentations um, for the webinar include uh, the one hour webinar sessions. And then we invite you to join us in Mozilla Hubs rooms. Uh, these were designed by the winners of our student competition. Um, there we will continue the conversation and engage with our presenters for an additional half an hour. So we welcome you to uh, the Hubs rooms after the presentation. All of our symposium links are available on Eventbrite. However, I will include the Hubs link in the um, chat box for all the attendees uh, for your convenience. So you have that handy as soon as the presentation is over. Uh, in an effort to counterbalance screen fatigue, which I know we all are dealing with that these days, uh, during the symposium, we are offering a short yoga break um, at your desk, no mat is required, uh, with our resident Frameless Labs yoga instructor, Lisa Savage Katz. So be sure to jump back into the webinar at noon. She's going to give us some tips on, on how to rebalance both at our desk, standing and sitting. At the end of the day today, beginning at 4.30, we'll be offering a huge variety of amazing demos that will be showcased in various hubs rooms uh, via Zoom meetings and streamed on the Facebook YouTube channel. Again, all the links are available on the Eventbrite schedule. And finally, we're gonna end this symposium on Friday. We invite you to join us for a RIT alumni event with graduates working in the immersive technology field located in, uh, again, in our students designed hubs rooms.
So I hope you all enjoy the programming over the next two days. And now it is with great pleasure that I present our president of Rochester Institute of Technology, David Munson, who will be introducing our keynote speaker. Thank you, Susan. Let me offer my uh, sincere welcome to all our attendees this morning uh, for this uh, wonderful symposium. It's my pleasure to introduce our uh, plenary speaker. Terence Masson is an educator and computer graphics historian with 30 years of production and education leadership experience. As an animation and visual effects uh, artist and producer, his work includes live action visual effects, animated feature and short film, uh, short animated films, VR, AR, video games, and theme park special venues. Prior to joining the School of Visual Arts as chair of the MFA Computer Arts Department in 2016, he founded and served as CEO of a location-based mobile augmented reality company called, in, called Building Conversation to serve on-site architectural visualization. His book, CG 101, A Computer Graphics Industry Reference, is a standard text worldwide for both studio execs and students, now available online at www.historyofcg.com. Terrence came up through the ranks on more than 20 feature films, including Hook, True Lies, Interview with a Vampire, and three Star Wars movies along with supervising numerous interactive projects such as SimCity 4, Bruce Lee, Batman Dark Tomorrow, and Alter Echo. He developed the original CG animation method for South Park way back in 1996, and his short film, Bunky and Boo Boo, won first place in the World Animation Celebration in 1998. An active volunteer with SIGGRAPH since 1988, Terence served as the 2006 Computer Animation Festival Chair, SIGGRAPH 2010 Conference Chair, and ACM SIGGRAPH Outstanding Service Awards Chair. Terence is a member of the Producers Guild of America, the Visual Effects Society, and a past ACM Distinguished Lecturer. He's now been, or he's, he is now uh, involved with, or has been involved with a VIEW conference since 2010. So without further ado, let's offer a warm virtual welcome to Terrence Masson. Yay. I'm on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, greetings to all my friends in upstate New York and all around the world. That was a great intro, David. Thank you very much, President David Munson, uh, David Halberstein, Susan, Joe, uh, for inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm really looking forward to this very much. Um, my name is Terence Masson. I am the chair of the MFA Computer Arts Department at the School of Visual Arts in Manhattan. Uh, today I'm speaking to you from sunny Grafton, Massachusetts. Um, and uh, what am I going to talk about today? So let me, I'm going to share my screen so you don't just see me. And there we go. Hopefully you can see that. Um, I'm going to talk about mixed reality and lifelong learning. I was thrilled to be asked to, to talk to you all. Um, and I want to talk with you as well. So uh, if you haven't seen it already, there's a there's a Q&A panel. Uh, please actively send me questions while I'm talking. Uh, and I'll do my best to answer them um, through the, the course of my, my uh, lecture. Uh, and anyone that I don't get to, we'll talk about uh, after. So, um, but firstly, I've had many roles uh, in my, my 30 plus years. Uh, these are just some of the job descriptions you students are gonna uh, be getting when you go out there. Uh, the most important ones I've highlighted uh, on the bookends, they're educator that I've been doing for a dozen years now, of course, but also husband and father. Um, and I love a good story, and I love having fun, those of you who know me. Uh, so I'm going to try to tell a lot of stories today. And I thought a way to, a fun way to do this, to talk about lifelong learning and mixed reality, um, was talking about my career, my evolution, and the evolution of mixed reality. 
uh, from a first person perspective, mine, uh, behind the scenes, so to speak. Um, so I'm going to actually start off uh, by showing um, a, a demo reel that I unarchived um, about feature film visual effects computer graphics work that I started out doing in the late 80s and in the 90s. Um, and so I'm going to do that. So I'm going to pop out of this. These are just some of the some of the films. This is just a minute long, but I'm going to I'm going to show this and hopefully you'll hear the audio. If you don't, it's just background demo room music. Model 2 is coded to the personal DNA of the judge using the weapon. A failsafe security. Did you know about this? No. The DNA is obtained from my medical files. Each time a round is chambered and fired, the projectile is tagged with the relevant DNA. And in other news today, billionaire Bruce Wayne has extended his trend-setting profit-sharing program. <laughs> Quite a few times. She's the fastest hunger jug in the galaxy. Oh, Chewie, give me the gun. Uh -huh. Don't move, Lando. Uh -huh. All right, so here we go. So there you have it, definitive proof. Boba Fett will not be showing up in the Mandalorian because I fed him to the Sarlacc. So uh, I'll get to this right after these next couple of slides, but the this evolution of mixed reality for me started with live action visual effects, um, but also my experience with video games, some of these you might recognize, launch of the original Xbox, um, short animated film, feature animated film, um, these guys up here. Um, I did think I'd start with the first story, um, mixed reality, uh, mixing media includes uh, construction paper. So uh, in 1996, a couple of kids from the Midwest contacted me about this pilot they wanted to pitch and they were calling it South Park, but it takes six months to do 22 minutes with a traditional animation stand, you know, downward shooting camera, two side lights, stop motion, on a uh, on an animation stand so i had to figure out a way to be able to do this in a couple of days uh so using computer graphics uh alias on an sgi uh you can see oh actually here see the i still have them a plastic baggie full of original south park construction paper heads and uh, basically just this meeting is being 
reported. And just being, uh, um, sorry, I had a little uh, recording in my, my ear there for a second. Um, just basically uh, made it look like construction paper, but it was computer graphics. So the, it looked like the aesthetic that Matt and Trey uh, were pitching. Uh, we pitched it to Comedy Central. I did a 10 second test side by side. Um, the execs at uh, Comedy Central couldn't tell the difference. So they, they bought the series. So uh, instead of running the animation studio for uh, Matt and Trey to set up the South Park series, I chose wisely, I thought, to go up to uh, ILM and work on the Star Wars Special Edition trilogy uh, in 96. So um, I don't know who Patrick is, but uh, my daughters, if you're out there listening, uh, I think it's pretty cute that daddy's a, immortalized as a farting peanut head in, uh, in South Park. So as I said, get ready to ask me anything. Uh, I am gonna be looking in the Q&A uh, window if you have any uh, questions as I'm going forward. Um, but basically, collaboration is where it really started for me, this lifelong learning. Uh, and I could not have gotten a better start than at ILM, uh, Industrial Light and Magic. So back in 1990, uh, T2 has ju ha was just wrapping and um, ILM was really the best and almost only place in the world to do very high-end visual effects in all the traditional ways. Um, and of course, computer graphics was just starting to come into reality. So I was incredibly fortunate to be there to, to ask to join the team. Um, I archived T2 off of the, the digital disc recorder to make room for um, our new film uh, hook. And um, so, so back then, mixed reality was old school analog visual effects, matte painting. This is UCA Westkey, literally painting with a paintbrush on a board. Uh, you can see Neverland there for, for hook. Um, and combining old school visual effects with live action, which is in, in, in itself mixed reality, but with new, brand new computer graphics that we were inventing from scratch uh, for the first time. Um, and it was just obviously uh, the time of my life. Um, lots of things overlapped. You can tell what projects we were, we were getting ready to, to do pre-production on here. Uh, this was now 1991. So I think we had a full two years of pre-production on uh, the original Jurassic Park. Um, and I was very lucky to have uh, as a, a mentor, as we all did, um, Dennis Muran, who was very grounded in actual reality. Talk about augmented virtual reality, but actual reality. So these large scale maquettes of dinosaurs, he would say, you know, take these in your hand, bring them outside in the real sunlight and see the play over skin texture under real light. And then, and then, and only then go to the computer and, and try to replicate that. But don't, don't be so focused on the computer to come up with something um, uh, from scratch. And that's been great advice uh, my whole life. Um, I left ILM the first time um, because um, I love new technology. I love things that have never been done before. Um, I love nothing better than for someone to tell me something can't be done. Sign me up. <laughs> uh, if it's impossible, sign me up. So this, so in 1993, uh, I went and joined a uh, another dream uh, opportunity, um, uh, an icon of visual effects, uh, Doug Trumbull, um, to work on the Luxor project for the Luxor Hotel in Las Vegas. We developed uh, three different radically um, breakthrough theme park rides for the the show floor of that of that hotel, and we used the uh, stereo lithography, which is the uh, the kind of um, grandfather the early early stage of 3D printing. So this was 1993, and I know 3D printing has since taken on uh, recently, but back then it was the most stunning achievement to model something at the t in B splines, 
NURBS uh, in alias uh, that doesn't exist, you know, zeros and ones, totally fictional, totally uh, virtual. Um, prep it in the right way, hit the button and go over to this vat of goo, right? That, uh, you know, intersecting UV lasers and pull this thing out and hold it in your hand, something that doesn't exist or didn't until you did that. So that just, you know, talk about mixed reality, really mind blowing. Um, and then what we did was took those stereolithography models that were designed by the art department, interpreted by my department, image engineering, that I put together, uh, a big precursor to what we call pre-visualization today, um, and then use that model to make a mold and make copies in the model shop to then paint and dress these miniature sets. So this is a, a 16th and 8th scale miniature set with a painted psych, a giant gantu crane above that we would smoke the set. And that gantu crane you can see was telescoping vertically, it would go left to right, up and down, and then rotate on a gimbal on the head. And that camera move I designed in alias with Doug, uh, wrote a translator and drove this multi-ton rig over a miniature set made up of parts that I designed. And, you know, you get to talk about mixed reality, right? It's just insanely cool. Um, and I was just, you know, beyond giddy. So I went back to after this wrapped, um, I did a lot of other things, including video games, setting up a consulting company in Los Angeles, um, did South Park, but then was asked to go back to ILM a second time in 1996 to work in the Star Wars Special Edition trilogy. Hope I'm getting this right. Yes, including Phantom Menace, just following that. So this was a secret weapon. So this was before particle systems were, were um, really usable. Uh, they were still very, very new. Uh, PDI had pioneered them in, in commercials, uh, and we had used them in a very rudimentary way on hook a few years before. But there was a scene in uh, a sequence in Phantom Menace that I was supervising called the Stampede Sequence. And we needed to come up with a way to have interactive splashes for these CG animals on live action plates. So the ground is real, ground is a swamp, real fern plants, um, real trees, all composited out of a 200 different elements in a flame system that we called Saber. Obviously, Liam Neeson is live action. Um, but as the super smart people, way smarter than me, were attempting to write millions of lines of code to do particle systems. Dennis Muran again says, T-Man, let's go to the shooting stage. We got out a waiting pool, put down a black plastic garbage bag, fill it with water in a darkened shooting stage, hit it with a key light, got a step ladder, digital video recorder, and we took turns stomping and splashing around in the water, videotaping, right? And taking that tape back, digitizing it, all you image processing people, quick luminance key. And suddenly we had hundreds and hundreds of variations of different size and types of water splashes to key in to the composite. Meanwhile, the smart people <laughs> are writing their millions of lines of code and I'm done. So this is a great example I love to talk about. It was absolutely thrilling. Again, mixing media, mixing live action, mixing miniatures, um, just being really creative. Um, and that's gonna do well when we talk later about, about other things. So, um, so fast forward 20 years, um, lots more fantastic adventures with video games and virtual reality and, and movies. And I traveled extensively internationally, which I'll talk about a little later. And this term creative industries is um, well established and very well understood in the world, except for North America. <laughs> for some reason, it hasn't caught on. But 
anywhere else in the world, it's a uh, it's a very um, apropos phrase um, related to what we're talking about. So because while collaboration again is mandatory in production, because these teams that I worked with were just phenomenal, um, collaboration is not always mandatory in education. Right? We're all too familiar with the siloing that can happen. Um, and uh, the isolation that can happen between departments or, or, or between programs. So prior to SVA, I built uh, an interactive media and game design program uh, from scratch at a university in Boston to cross academic disciplines uh, and departments and combine the art department, engineering, physics, software development, music technology, business, game design uh, from all these different departments and colleges. Um, and one of those capstone projects was an augmented reality project that David mentioned in the introduction. It was about 2013. And this is it. So um, my partner, George Thrush, he came up with the idea or the question, really, he was a um, world renowned architect, he founded the School of Architecture. Um, and he said, um, it's got to be possible to be able to stand on the site of an empty lot in a city and visualize the digital model of the proposed building. And remember, this was 2013. Um, but immediately, having been so experienced with SIGGRAPH and being that community was it's so far ahead and visionary with the research people in that community that it seemed obvious to me that, oh, well, augmented reality, uh, mobile devices have a location awareness and GPS. So if you just geolocate a virtual model relative to the mobile device, right, offset that, you can light it. So we did that. Um, and uh, it was a, a absolute thrill, again, um, you know, I tell my students, never be afraid to fail, never be afraid to take risks. I love when something's never been done before. <laughs> and I, I love the challenge. So, you know, taking a virtual model, um, projecting it as a tabletop, then scaling it full size, going into the front yard, being able to light it, rotate it around, walking full scale on site through a virtual wall into a virtual living room uh to look around it was uh it was really stunning unfortunately a, a little too radical a little too early uh this technology this ar technology as you know is um is much easier to develop today uh still not quite ubiquitous um you know there's uh commercial games uh, and things like that but uh it was an incredible learning experience raised angel capital got early adoption clients but um but I'm a early, uh, call it visionary thinker. I like thinking beyond the horizon, things that, again, that have never been done before that are extremely challenging. I get bored easy, I guess is another way of saying. Um, so growing a company and making it scale uh, was not something I was either good at or interested in. So um, I got the opportunity to, um, I got a, a phone call from SVA. They were looking to, um, hire a new chair. Uh, previous chair was re retiring after a very long and successful career um, at my department's 30th anniversary. So the School of Visual Arts were in Manhattan, in Midtown. Um, and so I, I was beyond thrilled. It was, the, it was and is the, the dream job uh, that I could possibly uh, ha have ever imagined. Um, and what I want to do is show you just as a little introduction to talk more about mixed and augmented and virtual reality is show a little demo reel of our most recent um, students work. And that is right here.
close that and go back to here. All right, so that's just a sample of um, our experimental art students. Uh, when I took over the department, um, it was the MFA computer art department, singular. Um, and so I radically proposed uh, adding an S to the department because there's so much about computer arts uh, in addition to computer art. So did that uh, and recently changed the, the concentration uh, that we were calling fine art into experimental art. So that was an example of that. A lot of real time uh, uh, Unity, Unreal, um, projection mapped, interactive haptics, um, beautifully crazy gallery installations, game design, virtual reality projects. Um, and uh, so it's a two year MFA program with about 100 graduate students. Um, and the, let's see, I did that. And then the next, I just wanna call this up really quick. I wanna highlight just one of our graduates. What We've got 1200 alumni now, over 1200 alumni, because the department's going on 35 years. Um, and uh, so Camille is um, one of our many brilliant alum. Uh, he graduated in 2013 as an experimental artist, and he founded as the director of, of Volvox Lab in down in Brooklyn. Uh, and I just want to show his the website for this. Uh, th again, this is just a minute loop, but it just it's stunning to me what you students do after you graduate. Um, many of you will go on and and get fantastic jobs working at companies, small and large. But I encourage you talk about lifelong learning to consider uh, starting your own company, right? Pitching your own IP. I mean, look at the variety of this work. It's absolutely, I wanna work for this guy. <laughs> if, if, uh, if I have to find another job, and I hope I don't, um, this is amazing. Uh, again, projection mapped, interactive music, um, augmented reality projects, um, <laughs> virtual tennis, the variety of what you can do uh, out there with mixed reality is is quite literally unlimited. It's really just absolutely only limited by your imagination. Um, and to be able to just have that freedom, yeah, that's enough there. It's looping, so we'll go back to the presentation. Um, and uh, so more mixed reality examples. So one thing I personally did was, um, invited a collaborator in. So uh, some of you will know Bill Plimpton's work. Um, he's a multi-academy award nominated uh, king of independent animation. Uh, and his style is, as I was told by Google when I asked about supporting this project, his style is impossible to do in computer graphics. So I was told uh, because it's literally, he hand draws with colored pencil. Um, and uh, it's the most uncomputer graphics style, thankfully, uh, that exists. So naturally, being told it was impossible by the juggernaut that is Google Spotlight Stories, or was, um, I took it on. I said, great, I'm going to do it. So what we did was uh, one of his Academy Award nominated short films from the late 80s um, called One of Those Days was a first person adventure, perfect for VR, right? First person. Uh, and it was just a, a tale of somebody having the worst day ever. Um, so we worked together, uh, Bill and I, with a tight team of, uh, on the left, a local CG soup, um, current students at the time, um, and uh, in-house systems expertise of Jose. And we did this. So this, I've got an embedded video. So this is the aesthetic. So this is this is CG. So this is the VR environment uh, that couldn't be done. Um, mimicking his hand-drawn pencil sketch style. And this, I think we'll play, is an in, in embedded video. Uh, no audio. But uh, seeing us teleporting around one of his rooms. Um, and it was just absolutely thrilling, again, to accomplish something that uh, uh, had never been done before and uh, was incredibly challenging, you know, 
trying to figure out line work and um, mimic his because he, he he'll animate on multiple different frame rates, you know, on twos, fours. And uh, it was re it was tremendously successful as a as a as a demo. So last half of my talking about lifelong learning is this is a new normal. So um, we can't and shouldn't um, avoid talking about COVID and what we're all going through. Um, and the horror, honestly, that that so much uh, is being imposed upon all of us as as students and teachers and just normal people. But um, it's really opening the the horizon and the and the opportunity and the awareness of the, of the international community. I hope, um, and the importance of international influences. So, um, and again, don't forget about that Q and A window. If anyone has questions uh, about what I've been saying so far, before you forget, type them out. Um, so these I made a quick map and dropped little pins for. Every place I've either lived, worked, lectured like this, uh, taught. Um, and I've just been really, really fortunate uh, that um, work and education opportunities have allowed me to be invited all around the world and meet people, mostly students, uh, that have been so incredibly inspiring. So the, the, the cultural influences, um, the reality that um, we're all just citizens of the planet, honestly, and we're so alike, you know, especially 20 year olds around the world, they're not really very different at all. So um, it's it's been a fantastic journey for me uh, to have a little bit of a pause now uh, in the international traveling is okay with me, but I cannot stress and recommend more strongly to all of you young people and not so young like me, uh, to, to physically travel or virtually travel as much as you possibly can and just embrace and empathize with your fellows around the world for creative collaboration. Um, and this frameless is a, is a brilliant example. Um, there are others, um, as uh, David mentioned in the intro, I've, I've been very active in SIGGRAPH uh, I've been helping out FMX, some of you may know of, uh, in Stuttgart um, since 1999. View more recently, the last 10 years, um, SIGGRAPH Asia has, has developed large, and there's more, but, but take advantage as uh, student volunteers. Um, virtually all of these conferences will allow you to, to apply um, and offset conference fees. Um, and when they become physical again, uh, travel, expenses. Um, there's just no substitution for these communities, the research scientists, the educators, the production people. Um, computer graphics in general, I've, I like to say it's, it's so new, uh, even in the 30 years that I've been doing it and the 40 or 50 years that it's been around, um, the people who I I now can call my friends literally created this industry. You know, people like Jim Flynn and Ed Catmull and Alvy Ray Smith. The analogy I like to give is if you're working in aeronautics as an engineer or a pilot, anything to do with airplanes, if you were, if you were doing that today and Orbel and Wilbur Wright were still alive in their eighties that you could talk to them and say, so what was it like to come up with the concept of a wing that created lift and, when at Kitty Hawk, and it's it's literally that present uh, and recent to be able to to meet these people at these conferences. Um, so um, don't don't miss the opportunity. Um, so yeah, so yeah, CG one hundred and one came out in the late nineties. Um, I'm still a very much re read reading physical books kind of guy, but after the second edition, I decided let's let's go online, it, it's this too much that I like to tweak and correct and edit and add. So you can go here now, anytime you want, if you're interested and you should be in the history of computer graphics, including mixed reality. 
history is critical to be able to be informed about the present and plan the future. So um, this is just uh, my personal pet project, my passion project um, that I've had students helping me out with over the years. Um, and it's just meant to be an exploration wiki. So if you want to go to historyofcg.com, you can just search for keywords and hopefully get lost with, oh, the, this project that this person worked on and, and uh, oh, I didn't know they worked there and oh, they worked with this person. And it's, it's kind of an infinite, uh, infinite loop to get you in there. Um, so, and you need to do this. You need to have an eagerness of, of learning at whatever age you're at. Um, I mentioned not being afraid to fail, you know, being eager to try new things. Um, an interest and awareness, um, an engagement of international level of, of collaboration. Um, you have to do that to discover your own aesthetic, your own passion, your own stories that you're going to be telling, right? Because um, I, the other thing I, I tell my students is, you you've got to fail early, and often, because <laughs> if you don't iterate and iterate, you're never going to discover these happy accidents. Right, and that's why I, I started off talking about analog film work because nothing allows you the beauty of happy accidents and iteration more than paint and clay and pencil and um, computers. Not a very quick iterative tool, believe it or not. Uh, it's a great, great for execution. So, in closing, because I want to talk to you all, I want to have some time for for questions. Um, mixed reality today will give you this edge um, to do everything I just talked about. Um, you have the opportunity, students and teachers of any age, you have the opportunity to decide how to mix 2D and 3D and XR with your storytelling, right? And um, so my advice is to be brave, be bold, be humble, um, and let this, this, this new normal, this, this COVID reality, let this adversity make you stronger, make it inform your art. And I mean that sincerely. Um, you gotta have your voice be heard and change the world for better now as an artist. I really mean that. Um, and if you, this quote has been attributed to a lot of different people. Um, including Aristotle and Plato, I think, but um, those who tell the stories rule the world. And we need you to take over the world right now and make it a better place. So thank you for listening very much. Please stay in touch. Um, email me at SVA. You can tweet at me. I'm fairly active on Twitter. Um, thank you again for the opportunity. Thank you to uh, Catherine and Jason for uh, interpreting. Uh, to this, uh, this to a, a wider audience, and um, I think I'll 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 be ready for questions now. I'll keep this slide up, and maybe I'll stop sharing my screen in case we want to come back. There, did I do that? I think I stopped sharing my screen. Um, so I'll go to a couple of questions. Um, to my, uh, my collaboration point, someone is asking, Richard is asking, uh, K through 12 and post-secondary ed education are notoriously late to the party in using innovative tools to deliver content. Oh boy, we've, we've, as educators, we've been, we've been forced uh, to do that now, haven't we? Um, outside of classes created to teach students on how to create mixed reality, what are best practices I've seen in educators? Partner, oh, partnering with companies or experts in mixed reality to learn how to rethink. Boy, that's a great question. Um, it's not very fancy, but what we're doing right now is an example of that, right? Um, about 70% of my graduate students at SVA are international. Um, and despite all of our similarities, the, the cultural differences are real and, and are to be respected. Uh, some of that is um, cultural uh, uh, um, sensitivity to uh, 
educators to, to seniors in the classroom. What I mean by that is that using Zoom alone as a, as a tool um, to innovate and deliver new content to the question, uh, some of these students are blossoming with Zoom that they like they haven't in the classroom. It might seem counterintuitive, but um, with younger people you know, in their 20s, this is very natural. It's social media, right? It's camera. They're not physically sitting next to their fellow students. Um, so that, that's been great. So we've seen students really benefiting um, to this, this Zoom teaching. Um, but uh, I've, got, I've got colleagues at, at places like Google that are coming up with really breathtakingly simple concept, but radical teaching tools for elementary, you know, for, for elementary school, public school, that um, one thing I haven't touched on was uh, AI and machine learning. So that field, I'm sure you're doing at RIT, is, uh, is going to have um, uh, a massive impact, um, unlike we've ever seen, and, you know, haven't seen in a long time. Uh, and to be able to have that as a back end, as a teacher, teacher's assistant tool for the student so that a student in the flipped classroom can have a machine learning AI behind it and say, you didn't get that question right, Johnny, but did you think about it maybe this way? And, and literally guiding a student through finding how their brain works, because what's clear through research, uh, as we all know as educators now, is everyone learns differently. There's no one formula, especially at elementary age. So that, that to me is breathtaking to have that kind of tool to nuance and have almost like genetically um, specific cancer treatments and medicine to have um, individualized teaching um, tools in the classroom uh, is going to be huge at the elementary uh, age, especially. Let me get to some lots of other questions. Thank you for typing so much. Um, let's see. Uh, advice for creating interface between creative and technical individuals. Um, you just got to do it. Uh, you, there's no, there's no way you're going to be either one or only the other. I've, I've, I talked a little bit maybe more than a little bit in my, in my lecture right now about how I've done that um, as an educator. Uh, I mean, right now with our virtual reality storytelling course, we're collaborating with a, a, a friend of mine, Ken Perlin and his postdoc lab at NYU. And to generalize, say there, his folks are say 80% super technology brainiacs and mine are 80% creative geniuses, right? So that overlap was, is brilliant. It's beautiful um, having a collaboration across um, those programs and those institutions. So if you're a student asking that question, ask your teachers, ask your department heads. Um, if, you, if, you, if you want to collaborate with the music department, the history department, um, I, I assume, I hope that you're already doing that, <laughs> but uh, don't, don't wait for someone else to do it. You know, make it happen. Um, of all the projects I worked on, which one is your favorite? Oof, well, I got to fly the Millennium Falcon. So that was pretty cool uh, with George Lucas. Um, <laughs> it's kind of hard to top that. Um, but I think it's more the people that I've worked with um, that more than as much as the projects, you know, collaborating with you know, Jim Cameron, George Lucas, uh, Doug Trumbull, um, Joel Hynek. I mean, all these and a hundred other more that are closer to my age that, that have just really influenced me and made it fun. That's, that's been the best. Um, I mentioned interactive haptics. Can I comment more on that? Yeah, so haptics, uh, most of you know, just you know, touchy-feely. It's interactive, physical touching things is how I interpret haptics. Um, so what our students do is what I talked about uh, basically is um, doing projection mapped um, interactive surfaces. So, uh, you know, having real-time graphics being generated um, and projected um, on the fly in a physical gallery space that's physically touched upon and interacted with. Um, and, you know, that description can be a thousand different things, and it is. Uh, and it's, it's 
you know, stunning, <laughs> frankly, to see what students do with that. And we have a 12th floor in my department that's completely dedicated to uh, open studio loft use uh, and utilization for, for these kind of mixed reality things. Um, could I look into my crystal ball and give your thoughts on the role of VR in the industry of media and storytelling? Well, um, so crystal ball. So um, I'm a firm believer, having used my crystal ball <laughs> for the last 30 years, that Moore's Law uh, and artists in general using these tools, you really don't ask or expect any kind of portent beyond maybe five years at the most. It's just, I trust me, it's impossible. Um, no one can imagine what's beyond the horizon further than that. Um, I think now it's here to stay. Uh, you know, VR came up uh, once before or twice before, and it was just too early. The hardware and the software and the, uh, the networking in general just wasn't there, wasn't ready, uh, you know, in the late in the 80s. So um, it's uh, it's here to stay. Uh, what I love is that uh, systems like the Oculus Quest 2 that just came out, um, unfortunately, it's related to Facebook, which people like me aren't that crazy about, but it's a, it's a wonderful system and it's 300 bucks. Um, you know, you can go high end with a uh, state of the art system I have here, the valve index. And it's just my eight year old son embraces this as the new norm. It's just, it's perfectly cool and great. Like my older daughters are in their late twenties. They grew up on the very first Macintosh computers and interactive storytelling and books and things. So, um, I'm digressing a little bit from the question, but look to however old you are, look to your a younger generation, <laughs> never underestimate uh, the brilliance and creativity and insight of children of any age. Um, again, my, my son who's eight, he's been programming for years. He's using Python. Um, look to them to, to change the world. Um, these are great questions. Thank you. Do you have a general principle to preserve the quality of each medium when mixing mediums? Ah, for example, in the VR pencil drawing project. Um, that's a great question. Very typically, you actually have to down res things to match them to other media. Um, when we were doing um, episode one, Phantom Menace, the quality of the opticals and the lenses, they were filming live action elements were so bad, <laughs> we, we had to put in warped um, image field distorting, um, chromatic aberration. And we found through testing um, that rendering computer graphics to match the live action, anything over 2K was a waste of pixels because the opticals we were matching to were just that not great. <laughs> so um, it's it's not a matter of, oh, there's 8K televisions coming. I've got to, you know, it's the optical resolution, frame rate, shutter rate, motion blur, things like that are much more um, applicable to realism, apparent realism than resolution. Does that make sense? Um, Quick digression, if, if, if you wanna research the history of matte paintings, do this. Uh, I showed that picture of, uh, you say, Wesky painting for, uh, for Hook. They're very abstract and painterly. Um, it's, they're not super high resolution detailed paintings at all. You'll be shocked at how low resolution and impressionistic matte paintings are for feature films that you've seen. Um, so I've only got a couple of minutes um, and I wanna to try to get to all your questions. Uh, do you think XR, VR can teach values and attitudes like empathy and humility? Oh, thank you for asking that question. That's so important to me. Empathy is huge. Specifically, look up Ken Perlin's work again that I'm collaborating with. He's an old friend. He's one of the most brilliant people I know. Um, and he's specifically developing extremely low cost, off the shelf, socially collaborative, multi-person, location independent, virtual reality experiences. So you can be collaborating 
creatively as avatars in a space with a robot who's actually an 80 year old Russian woman from Kazakhstan or a 12 year old boy from Africa. And it's, it's gender neutral, it's culturally neutral and, and you're, just, you're just making art. And it's absolutely brilliant, great question. Uh, Cause that empathy is, I think the core of a lot of the problems that are happening today in, in our politics and divisions and all of that. So um, maybe one more question. Let's see, what fundamental skills and areas of knowledge would you say are the most crucial to this evolving field? Okay, well, I mentioned a couple, history. You've got to know the history of filmmaking, of art, art history, um, the people, the places, the things, the tools, what's come before, the failures that others have made, the mistakes, the iterations that have come before that's absolutely critical, drawing, um, photography, get outside. You've got to be out of your cubicle and away from this. Um, nothing more important than that. And one last question. I like how you take on visions that seem impossible. Is there anything you took on but didn't work out? <laughs> That's a great question. My best failure. Oh boy. Oh, I've got like 60 seconds to think about this. So I'm going to pause. Um, so I, I can't think of a failure of any kind, but I'll cheat by kind of answering the question in a different way um, about the, the jobs that I've applied for and wanted passionately more than once in my career that I didn't get. And I'm so grateful I didn't because at the time I was heartbroken and thought my career was over. I didn't get this dream job at EA or Disney or, um, but what opportunities were afforded me after that got me to where I am today. And I'm so grateful uh, and happy. So that would be my advice to, to students or anybody who's changing jobs is just be open to new opportunities, even though they're not, might not be the ones you think that you want. And I think I came within five seconds of my time limit. So I'll, and I finished all the questions. Great questions. You are perfect. <laughs> right on time. I love it. Thank you so much, Terrence. One of, one of the downfalls of the webinar versus the Zoom is we don't have any little reactive icons. So we, I have to visually clap and I- I can I'm hear sure the cheers is, from Rochester. Yes. From our, we have a hundred attendees yeah. here. <laughs> oh, fantastic. No, that was a blast. And I mean it, please stay in touch. Uh, we're going to go to the, um, the hub room next, I guess, right? Yes. And so I'm going to, if the attendees can give uh, the panelists a, a little heads up, we do have limits in how many people can be in the hubs rooms, but we do have three different rooms. So you guys can go back and forth. Hmm. And then I will, um, uh, I will put in the chat room for the attendees, just so you have it at your fingertips the links and I also put those in for um, Terrence and, and Dave and Jason and Catherine as well too. So you guys can get in um, straight away. So thank you again, Terrence. Um, awesome lecture. Loved you. Uh, you know giving the overview. Always love the behind the scenes stories of some of our favorite films. And then being able to have see that foundation and that history that's so important as we're looking and jumping into all the evolving and new technology. So really appreciate it. appreciate your time. And thank you to our president, David Munson, for joining us and for introducing Terrence. Really appreciate it because I know it's a super busy time for you right now. And also our interpreters, you, Jason and Catherine, really appreciate it. Thank you all. It was a great privilege. Hope to see you all in person sometime soon. If you come to Midtown Manhattan, please come and visit me at SBA.